What's up, Degenerate Nation? Welcome to the Big Bets on Campus podcast presented by BetMGM. This is the initial NCAA tournament bracket reaction show. I'm Stucky, and joining me today, I should say tonight, are Craig Waddell, Mike Calabrese, and Anthony DeBundo. We are going to go through each region, just pretty high level, won't be an overly in-depth episode and we'll just give some high level thoughts maybe some sleepers and anything that jumps out as far as opening lines are concerned do some initial reactions uh but before we get into that just and we can yell about things as we go through each region but your initial or your one thing that you're you want to gripe about after the bracket was released uh i'll start it's that I mean, look. At the end of the day, I don't care. All these bubble teams. Uh, I wish St. John's would have gotten in, just because I think that team has super high upside, um, and it just baffles my mind that only three Big East teams got in. It's like it, that's just crazy. It's the second best league by most metrics, and we're saying UConn's the number one overall seed, um, which I agree with. But Big East only getting three teams in, I just doesn't sit right with me. And the fact that Virginia gets in. It's a team that was not, I don't even have them as a top 75 team in the country. Uh, and that's outrageous. I have St. John's the top 25 team. So, and then we got to watch more Virginia basketball, which sucks. Uh, but I'll say just the, my biggest gripe, whatever. Then the, the teams get in, there's line set. We break down the matchups, fill out our brackets, try to find some edges, but the seat, some of the seating was just comical. Uh, I mean, apparently New Mexico was going to be out if they didn't win the Mountain West championship. New Mexico gets the same seed as Duquesne. I mean, Duquesne is an 11 seed is outrageous. BYU falls from the five to the six because they can't play on Sundays. And as a result, they get Duquesne in 11, who should be like a 13 or 14 seed. So some of the seeding, the Mountain West seeding was pretty bizarre. FAU is an eight seed. I thought that they might get left out. So some of the seating, I don't know where they're coming up with some of this stuff. And the net, the net, the net, F the net. The net doesn't matter, uh, apparently. Uh, St. John's a 25 in the net. Who cares? Devonda, what do you got? Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway is something that we kind of knew this week. You know, the more chaos there tends to be during conference tournament week where you have all these number one seated mid-major teams lose. And then you have all these bid stealers come from the power conferences. You get weaker mid-major 12 to 15 seeds. And that's absolutely the case. If you just compare efficiency metrics of the teams of the past couple of years to this year, they are marginally worse teams that were 15s last year, uh, like a Princeton who has similar comparabilities to what Yale is this year. Well, now Yale's a 13, right? So two full seed lines uh, different there. And I think that's kind of a microcosm of how much weaker generally the field is once you get past those top teams. And yeah, I'm, I'm you know, the uncertainty is annoying as somebody who doesn't really care who gets in at the 65th through 68th, unless you're a fan of those teams, like, do you really care who gets in? Uh, not really. Uh, we're still going to watch the games, like you said, but in terms of creating fun matchups, uh, Virginia, Colorado state total at one eighteen and a half. and uh, a half, not exactly going to be the most exciting matchup, but then again, last year we had Pittsburgh and Mississippi state. So not exactly a thriller there either. So, you know, they don't always tend to be the best games in the, in the first four, but uh, ultimately, unless you're a fan of one of the teams, like I don't really personally have a vested interest in who plays in Dayton or who doesn't or whether Seton Hall gets in or St. John's. I'm just excited for these matchups. My biggest complaint, why does the number one two seed get paired with the number one one seed? That doesn't make any sense to me. Iowa State being the, you know, I think consensus best two gets placed in the same region as UConn. I think it really no, should. No, they weren't. They weren't the number. They, I think they are the number, the number one over two, but that's not allowed. That's actually not allowed. So they're, the committee's saying that Iowa State's not. The number one. Okay. Well, yeah. That's too. a mistake from the committee. Yeah. Uh, and I think, I agree. I you know, agree. docking them too much for non conference strength of schedule after they just beat a one seed by 25 on Saturday and uh, had played incredibly down the stretch and beat everybody they were supposed to beat. Uh, I, I was shocked that Iowa State got, I think, the the worst hose job of anybody in the committee, them and Auburn. Yeah. I mean, well, look at that. I mean, the, and by the way, some people care who gets in for futures. And for our podcast futures, they're all in the same fucking region. Uh, I have Houston to win the national title. I have some Kentucky from before the season. 
I have A and M to make the Final Four, uh, Colorado to make the Final Four. They're all in the same region, um, so some some sometimes it's just how the cookie crumbles. But you mentioned the East. The East UConn is the number one overall one. Iowa State, I think, is the number one overall two. Uh, you have Illinois, the Big Ten champ, is the three. Auburn, the SEC champ, is the four. You could argue there are two or a three. I mean, that region is brutal. Then you look at the West. It's like that meme where it's like the tough SpongeBob versus the uh, the weak one. The West is a joke. I mean, North Carolina is is your one. Arizona, your two. Uh, Baylor is your three. Alabama is your four. I mean, look at the difference between the East and the West. It's uh, pretty comical. Um, but I'll, I'll go to you, Greg. What are your your one gripe off the top? Uh, you guys are nailing the entire thing. I think conference tourney week is pointless, and I think the selection committee has essentially embraced that. There's no way that we get – the the what region is it the east yeah there's no way we get the east region with four teams that are each the strongest per ken palm of their seed line one two three and four that also just won their respective conference tournaments like we have the big east champion the big 12 champion both in blowout fashion the big 10 champion and uh the sec champion uh, like three of those four were blowouts and here you go here's your gauntlet north carolina you mentioned is the one seed in the west Illinois as the three seed is metrically the fourth best team in the East region. And they're separated by like half a percentage point. Like it's, it's a gauntlet. All of these teams would be teams I'd be picking deep in the tournament if they didn't have to get through each other. And uh, selfishly it's frustrating because as much as I love conference tournament week, I also feel like we sat back and watched a bunch of guys get banged up in games that the committee is telling us don't matter. Like how, how can we sit back and say, oh, 35 of the 36 at-larges were seated on Friday? Our work is done, but we still have all these games going, and then Florida loses their center. I I'm really frustrated by it. If there's one argument for expanding the tournament, it might just be that the committee wouldn't have to do their jobs anymore. And uh, maybe we would get a little more, I don't know, a, a little more sigh of relief at the end of this, because I'm frustrated with the way this shook out. Well, if the committee didn't have to do their jobs... Um then we'd have uh, St. John's in the uh, tournament. But, um, yeah, also in this region, in the East, I believe – hold on, let me pull it up. BYU's got to be the strongest six too, right? Just at a quick glance. Yeah, BYU is a six because they dropped down from a five. So you could argue the strongest six. And then your five – and eight seeds were in the final four last year. I mean, the East is is uh, just absolutely brutal. And then you have Moorhead State. It should be like a two seed in my eyes, but we'll get to them later. Calabrese, what do you got? Yeah, you guys are basically playing the right music here. I'm nodding along. Um, this is the scene out of The Departed during the stakeout where Alec Baldwin talks to the surveillance guy. Can I talk to you for a second? And he just loses it and wails off and punches him. That's Charles McClellan basically complaining. It's really complicated. We were up super late last night trying to, it's like, no shit, buddy. Like there's lots of different permutations that lots of different things can happen. You can't just slot to Kane in where VCU would have been. That like, what are you talking about? Like you make up multiple brackets that account for those outcomes. And it's given some teams, some cushier matchups as given some teams that didn't deserve harder roads, much harder roads forward. Like they screwed this whole thing up. That doesn't mean this won't be an amazing tournament and there won't be great upsets and the champion could be justified and everything else. But in terms of putting together a 68 team tournament, this is a steaming pile of crap. So they did not do a good job whatsoever. And there's a few teams as well that I'm upset with in terms of like, I really think they had Cinderella potential, but all of a sudden their draws make it nearly impossible to really get beyond the round of 64. So I'll just get into the matchups because in terms of the committee and putting this bracket together, I think we're all pretty much aligned. Yeah. So that what they're, I, I'm really curious to like, is would Temple have been a 12 seed? Like they, I think that's what he's saying game. essentially. Almost he's certainly. Like, yeah, especially since that game ended at five thirty. I mean, just an absolute joke. Um, yeah, there's all right. Well, yeah, let's let's get right into the 
let's go region by region. All right, before we get to go into region by region breakdown, it's time for everyone's new favorite part of the podcast, where I tell you this episode is brought to you by the Spring Cleaning Champions Manscaped. This season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in below-the-waist grooming. Clear out that winter bush with Manscaped's Lawnmower 5.0 and watch your confidence bloom like the springtime flowers. Join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our special offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code BBOC for 20% off plus free shipping. Manscaped's latest model also features dual LED spotlights to guide you through the darkest winter debris so you can navigate with confidence. And because this bad boy is waterproof, you can shave in the shower, in the bath, or in the ocean if that's what you're into. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code BBOC at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code BBOC at manscaped.com. Nothing like a little spring cleaning in your pants. Let's start in the East, where UConn is the number one overall seed in the gauntlet bracket. The gauntlet region is, or the region of death, as I'm going to call it. The two seed is Iowa State. Been through some of the teams here in this region. Greg, I'll throw it to you to give your first thoughts on this region. What are you seeing in the East? You can go whichever direction your little heart desires. Yeah, so I, I look, we nailed it already at the top of the show. It's loaded. All of the best teams per seed line for the top four are here. I, for me, Iowa State and Illinois, for sure, would have been teams that in other regions I would be looking to immediately pencil into the second weekend, uh, maybe look at a Final Four ticket, depending on where they're at. But the elephant in the room here is – it's UConn. It's the defending champ, right? Like I, you could even talk yourselves into like, okay, Iowa state, what can they do to Purdue? I don't know that I can do the same with UConn here and I'm trying to, but it's, it's frustrating that that's kind of the, these high major teams that we feel have a ceiling of making it all the way to Phoenix have to go through the big dog. With that said, one thing that jumped out at me immediately is that UConn's potential second round matchups in Northwestern and Florida Atlantic. Shout out to Calabrese. It's going to be a always... boo booey. That's the boo booey well, section of the podcast. Cal- Calabrese loves to shout out our boy, Evan Miyakawa, who has the opponent adjust metric. He launched it in the middle of the season. And Northwestern and Florida Atlantic grayed out extremely highly at playing their best against the best teams on their schedule. Remember, Florida Atlantic showed up, neutral court with Arizona, beat them. Northwestern, Purdue beat them, and then took them to overtime again. Like, these are teams that have demonstrated the ability to play up to the best teams in the sport. Florida Atlantic, I mean, we know the names on this team. There's talent. They have a – like, Golden is not going to physically shy away from Klingon, even though he's not as good of a player. Um, Like, uh, Elijah Martin and Jonald Davis will not be played off the floor by Cam Spencer and Tristan Newton – it does feel like one of those matchups to me where there's always the the narrative driven, oh my God, how did we put Kentucky and Wichita State in the 1-8 pod together? That's UConn, Florida, Atlantic for me. We almost got it in the national championship. Now here you go. But Boo Booey is probably the best player on the floor in that game. And they've been even better than Florida Atlantic's been against the best teams they've played. I know they're hurt. So on paper, Florida Atlantic should win that. But no matter who does, the point is, I don't think that second round game is going to be as easy for UConn as it might seem on paper. And as much as we're talking about how hard it is for everybody else to have to potentially go through UConn, man, for UConn to just get to a Final Four, to have to go through either FAU or Northwestern, who are great against good teams, and then, you know, Auburn, who has been fourth on Ken Palm for the last month, uh, just to get to an Elite Eight matchup with Iowa State, who just dogged Houston for 40 minutes – It's a really tough 120-minute stretch of basketball. So if you are someone out there that's been looking to be a skeptic of UConn for whatever reason, I think you got a draw that opens the door for a bunch of different ways they could potentially get picked off. But uh, I'll I'll open it up to the guys here if you have any other particular matchups you want to talk about because I do have my eye on one upset later later down the line after I hear your guys' thoughts. Yeah, I will say the one one seed that no one expects to lose early – um, 
I don't know. I, I feel like I'm going to go back, go back and look at this. By the way, we'll have our we'll go through every game, like I said before, more in depth on Tuesday night. We'll have a Thursday episode, then a Friday episode immediately following. But if you want, if you're in a huge pool and you want to get crazy, then you, you have UConn going down. Uh, the problem is I'm not fully convinced I know who's going to win that FAU Northwestern game, which then makes it tricky. Uh, but I, the thing that jumps out to me, and, and keep this in mind, we're going through each region, a one versus a two in any region has not happened since 2019. So the chalk has not held since 2019 in any region. It's gone 0, 0 of 12. I think it was Michigan State Duke in 2019. Uh, the one thing that jumped out at me immediately here, to, well, two things. Il if Illinois gets by Moorhead and BYU gets by Duquesne, Illinois BYU, who I did, what is that total? 247,000. Um, but that, I mean, that should be over City and BYU Illinois. But Moorhead State was a team that I had circled as a, the team I want to bet, and Illinois is a team that I wanted to fade as a bigger favorite. And then they happen to be matched up against each other. I still, I think there's going to be money that continues to come into Morehead State. Lines come down a little bit already, but Morehead State it profiles as the a Cinderella or at least a good underdog to back in the first round. Why? Very well coached. They slow the game down, and they have multiple guards who can get hot, but not too reliant on any guards. Riley Minix is a matchup problem, and their biggest weakness is their turnovers. Illinois, this is a matchup of two drop defenses. Illinois does not turn you over ever. 360th in the country in that department. And Illinois is so deadly in transition. Ward State doesn't really let you get in transition, and they're an elite transition defense. That's super important. So I think Moorhead State uh, is a good first-round bet. I wouldn't be shocked if they pulled off the upset and Illinois has – you know, the teams that I'm looking to fade are in the first round specifically – are teams with elite offenses that have vulnerable defenses. You know, teams, for example, teams that have a top 10 overall adjusted offensive efficiency and outside the top 100 defensive efficiency have never made it past the Sweet 16. Never. And Illinois is like 80th on defense, fourth on offense. That is the exact ratings of Iowa in 2022 when Keegan Murray went bananas. They won the Big Ten tournament. And they ran into a Richmond team that slowed the game down and beat them in the first round. Anthony, I'll throw it to you. What do you seeing in the East? Yeah, we were just joking about this, like fading the hot team that just ran through the Big Ten in the last few years has been quite profitable. Illinois went down to Loyola. Of course, Purdue last year and Iowa two years ago going down to Richmond. So it's kind of just like a beware of what you just saw. Teams tend to get overvalued off of a potential big run through a conference tournament. And look, Auburn, I think they have a huge ceiling. If you wanted to say, and just kind of do the comparison to last year, there's a certain four seed that was ranked in the top five in Ken Palm entering last tournament who had questions about their guard play at various points in the in the regular season, who had a really impressive front court and really great underlying metrics. And then they went on and just kind of buzzsawed everybody to a national title. If Auburn did that, I wouldn't be shocked. But also Auburn, their guards are erratic and they have the profile of a team that also could get picked off. And we've seen these Ivy League teams play up over and over and over again. And I think this Yale team is kind of comparable to what Princeton just did last year, playing against an Arizona team that kept turning the ball over. And that enabled Yale or Princeton last year to play slow, take possessions away from Arizona, shorten the game, execute in the half court, and prevent second chance looks because they were a great defensive rebounding team. Well, that's exactly what Yale is. Yale doesn't have a ton of depth in size, but... Like I said, it's the perfect profile to steal possessions from turnovers, get to the free throw line, and execute good half-court offense, and slow Auburn down. All of these SEC teams just want to get in track meets with Auburn. I don't think it's a great idea. Yale's not going to do that. So I think Yale is my favorite long-shot upset in this region. Uh, I'm going to sprinkle some money line. But then again, if Auburn does get past this, they're going to be catching, what, three and a half, four max against UConn? So they're going to be in a potential spot to really give UConn a, a tough game and they can match UConn in the front court like a few teams can. So I think Auburn is a very high ceiling, but I think their profile and like we've seen Bruce Pearl teams go down early before we've seen Ivy League teams pull off upsets. I think that's my favorite upset uh, in the first round. I want to jump so, in quickly on Yale stuck because that was my pick too. Um, so Yale 18th in the country at not turning the ball over some of Auburn. 
Yale's biggest wins this season. They've just been like jumping into teams and getting runouts. Yale slows it down, as you said, 327th slowest tempo. Auburn 58th. They're going to be frustrated. And lastly, Yale is great at preventing offensive rebounds, 13th in the country. Auburn is a very athletic team that just kind of wants to throw the ball up. If their guards are missing shots, Broom's going to be active on the offensive rebounds. Their athletes are going to be running. I don't think that's going to work against Yale. I like Yale to win this game outright as well. The bundle beat me to it. Yeah. Uh, Danny Wolf, too, a seven footer who can shoot threes. That's like a potential matchup problem for Auburn. It doesn't matchup problem for any team. And yeah, they play super slow. They're well coached. Um, we'll see how they deal with Auburn's athleticism. But they also force you, like, they're by design, they force teams into a ton of three. So, like, Auburn could fall in love with bad shots here, too which would be a detriment. So if you're filling out your bracket at home, put Yale through in the first round and then Auburn winning the national title. I don't know how that works, but that's the DeBundo math. Uh, Calabrese, what are you saying? So you guys have hit all the heavy hitters in this region. So I'm going to go with the team that you have not mentioned. And Greg teed me up because I love the Evan Mia metric. Who punches up, who plays better against better opponents? 24th in the country the Drake Bulldogs. They got a head coach who's won 74% of his games since he showed up in 2018. They went 10 and one down the stretch with all the pressure on them. They still had very slim at large hopes six weeks ago. They knew that they needed to essentially either win out or, you know, maybe just drop one game. So they handle the pressure. They beat Indiana state. They have one of the best single players in this region and Tucker DeVries. And he's someone I think stuck brings up many great points on this podcast throughout the year. That's not necessarily just situational, but one that he's brought up multiple times is it's difficult. If you're a single high scoring player from a mid major, because if they can take away your scoring prowess, then all of a sudden you're a lot more mortal in a head to head matchup. Well, the thing about Tucker is that he's one of the most efficient players in the whole country. He doesn't just impact the game scoring the basketball. He does average 22, but also seven rebounds, three and a half assists. He facilitates for his teammates. He can shoot at the outside over 36% from three point range. So I see all of this being put into the blender. And then you pepper in the fact that they get to play in Omaha, less than two hours from Des Moines. They're going to have a lot of home fans against Wazoo, which, uh, you know, I think that's a rough draw for Wazoo in terms of what they accomplished this year, beating Arizona and, you know, really being consistent for much of the season. I think that's kind of a raw deal for them. And then a head to head against Iowa State. I understand that they beat Baylor, you know, they dog walked Houston, but Coming into the tournament, the narrative on them a little bit was how much can they the accomplish? Of the podcast? We already cashed minus 10,000. We'd get a boo boo. We mentioned by Greg. Is this the uh, part of the podcast where you slander Lipsy? That's minus 10,000. You know what? Lipsy is someone who, if I took them to go to the Elite Eight and I see Lipsy with the ball in crunch time and he turns it over and the moment's too big and he doesn't want it, I'm g- the only person to blame is myself. Like, this is the only issue that I have with this team. Their metrics are rock solid. Their head coach is brilliant. Their defense is made for March to be able to string wins together. But this is a guard tournament. So go ahead and cash your minus 80,000 ticket. Lipsy is just not good enough, in my opinion, to win three or four games in this region. Wow. That's harsh. Uh, I love Taman. The Lipsy slander. Hometown kid, too. Also, Ames West, Omaha, Nebraska. You have Ames West, Ames South. Uh, what's Ames East? Uh, where's the final, the final fours in Phoenix? Ames East is uh, TD Garden next weekend. Yeah. Uh, we will go through who we have. So so if we – but I'll just go around the horn and I'll do this each for each region. We're going to assume that the trend continues. It might not. You might get a one versus two. But if there's not a one versus two at all this tournament, we're going to say that the trend continues. Um, in this region, anyone – not taking UConn in their bracket as of now. Things change. It's only a couple of hours in. No one's going to speak up. Huskies. So. Yeah, that's going to be the Huskies uh, for me too. Yep. Yeah, I'm trying. I mean, Auburn could give them a game just because of their talent. Um, but Auburn's got a tricky game against Yale, and then like San Diego State is going to ugly up the game, right? Like limit the possessions. Um, it's you know it's not an easy path for Auburn, and that's what you get for being underseeded as a four when and in the this brutal region when they probably should have been a two or a three. All right, uh, let's move on to the West. 
which is the we're gonna I'm gonna call it the huh what's the opposite of the region of life yeah I can't the region of life um what what word am I looking for here help me out the bundle uh I don't know. I'm just going to call it the feeble the region, region of no defense. Yeah, there's not a lot of defense in this region, but we're going to go to the West and we have something to note here is throughout is that there are in the Midwest and West, there are altitude games. So we'll talk about some of them throughout, but in the West, it's Dayton, Nevada and Arizona, Long Beach state, but in the West, North Carolina is the overall number one seed despite losing to NC state in the ACC championship, which ultimately kept Oklahoma out of the tournament as the last team out for the committee. Who am I going for for this? Just me. Okay. Uh, two seed, Arizona, three seed Baylor, four seed, Alabama, pretty underwhelming when you compare it to the top four seeds in the East Calabrese, I'll throw it to you as our West correspondent. What do you see here in the West region? As a pairing, the one and two seeds are the weakest, I think, of any of the regions. Uh, North Carolina certainly is trying to get the band back together, make this magical run with Baycott like they did in 2022, Davis, everything else. I'll, I'll put them aside for a moment. I just believe that they have serious vulnerabilities after the first weekend's. Then you look at Arizona. The past six weeks, they got road losses to Oregon State, a triple overtime win against Utah, and a 13-point loss on the road to USC. I don't think anyone here is banging the drum for Arizona to be a team that is, you know, basically steeled off to any upsets after the first round. I think they're going to be vulnerable in that regard. So I look at the middle of the bracket, somebody coming out of the – Second round matchup, at least in my projection, a Baylor, New Mexico. I think they're both really interesting. Baylor, the question is, how deep of a run are they primed to make? Because they performed well against Houston and Iowa State on the offensive end, at least once against Iowa State. They're healthier with Langston Love back. He's, I think, arguably the best sixth man in this entire tournament. They do struggle against better opponents. But I still think when you look at what they do on both ends of the floor, what Misi's brought for them in terms of their interior defense, they have the overall DNA of a potential team to go from the three line all the way to the final four. And New Mexico, we've mentioned it throughout the entire season. I love their starting five. I love what house potentially gives them. And you can argue that they haven't been dealing with a full deck for most of the season. Somebody has been banged up in their backcourt. Dent was just dealing with the flu. Like if they come into this hundred percent and are able to get past a difficult draw against Clemson in the first round, I think there's somebody who could, you know, surprise go sweet 16 elite eight. So that's interesting. And then finally, before I kick it to the group, Alabama and Auburn also being on the four line is just comical to me, like two teams that couldn't be further away in terms of my perception of them, Alabama away from T town, their defense is so horrific. I don't know if they'll get bit by Charleston, but I do think if grand Canyon can get by St. Mary's, they have what it takes to beat a team like Alabama. So I'm going to go ahead with my sleeper pick there. I, I like the antelopes to go to the sweet 16 and Bryce drew to get a really nice payday going into the off season. Uh, yeah, I like, I like, I like Charleston in the first round. Got catching double digits. I think that line should be like eight and a half. Um, and I would imagine that comes down probably close to like eight. Um, but what do I know? Might not. Um, but I, Alabama is similar to Illinois, the team I'm looking to fade. Yes, great offense, but no defense. So, like, Charleston's going to get buckets, and they can hang around there. I wouldn't be surprised if Charleston won that game outright. And especially Alabama, high-variance team. If you're looking for an upset, they shoot a ton of threes. If they're off, Charleston can win that game easily. Yeah, Charleston's going to put up 30 threes, at least. Yeah, going to be that, just that their season average. three-point variance game uh, of the first round. And – and a super high total. What's it? I don't think a first round game's closed this high in a long time. Um, what's the total at? One seventy two, I think. I saw someone look that up. Yeah, I can look it up for you. I just bet Charleston, so I should remember from seeing it. One seventy one. That total sitting at one seventy one and a half, which is 
super high for a tournament. No NCAA tournament game has closed with a total of above 168 since 2002. So this, if this stays here, this is the highest total by four points in 20 plus years. Um, that's pretty crazy. But uh, I'll also give you a favorite I like, Baylor laying, what is this, open 12 and a half, 13 against Colgate. I think they blow the doors off of Colgate. The athletic and talent disparity in that game is massive. And this Colgate offense just isn't the same. It's not your older brother's Colgate offense. They're outside the top 200 in offensive adjusted efficiency. They live in the post, but uh, you're not like you're not playing Lafayette anymore. Records um, is going to get eaten up by Meetsy. Yeah, Records is in yeah. big trouble in that game. Yeah, shout I, out I, Jeff I, Woodward, pack legend. Yeah, I mean Jeff Southeastern Woodward can PA. eat up Navy, but uh, he's not going to eat up Baylor, a team with three pros on the floor. That when your defenders have to fit them. in a submarine, that's usually a, a bad you know, precursor to your performance in March Madness. Yeah, that's, I think, Devonta, you mentioned this with Baylor on our live show that we did. Two teams that profiled similar to Baylor that Colgate played. Because I loved Colgate against Wisconsin. They had a much better offense, and that game was going to be slow. And that's, you know, a game that Colgate can hang around in. But you mentioned the two teams that – the two other teams that Colgate faced in the past three years in the tournament – who profile similar, more similarly to Baylor, they got the doors blown off. Yeah, Arkansas beat them by 17. Texas beat them by 20 last year. And neither – Arkansas, remember, they were down like 10. They were down by must 10. Put the, close must the put the press on them, and then it was over. Yeah. 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 Um, And, yeah, so those are my initial thoughts. Greg, I'll throw it to you. I'm most curious, Greg, you can go wherever with this, but I want to get your thoughts on Michigan State. I know you follow them closely a team that people were saying maybe they're out, but now it's like, can they handle Tolu Smith? And then you, you got, you got the one that you would want. So are we back to January, February Izzo? I I think by default. Yeah. I like, I'm getting the same sick feeling in my stomach that I got last year when they, I thought they had a favorable draw, right? Like they, they, they had Shaka Smart with a banged up Tyler Kolick in the second round. And all of a sudden we're rethinking, can A.J. Hogard lead a team to a Sweet 16? Like, yeah, I guess you can if that's what you get. Uh, if you listen to any of the bracketology experts that are way smarter than I am on this, Michigan State should have been two full seed lines further down this list. They were the top nine. Like, this team was almost an eight seed, which takes me back to what is anyone on the committee doing? They're not doing their job. Uh, but – no, that's very favorable. They're going to be a favorite in this game. Opened up minus two and a half. I believe it's already down to minus one and a half. This is a team, Mississippi State, they're 12 spots lower than Michigan State on Ken Palm. Like, and I get the metrics have liked Michigan State all year. They've lost a lot of close games and their wins have been more uh, decisive, which is part of it. The Baylor win holds a lot. I feel like the Baylor win props off Michigan State. They beat Baylor by like 40. Yeah, that that was worth like seven other wins, apparently, for any other high major <laughs> team in the country. I don't know. But no, it's it's right there. I mean, you're looking at uh, a Mississippi State team that's lost five of seven and then an NC State team that just got DJ Burns. Like, <laughs> of course, if Tyson Walker's hot, that that's very there for the taking. I think this entire region's there for the taking, boys. Uh, I alluded to this in messages to you before we jumped on here. This is my chaos region. I think around the other three regions, there's a lot of reasons to believe it's going to be chalky. I think we're going to have a mess here. I don't trust any of the top four teams in this region. This is not draw dependent, by the way. I'm just saying, do I look at any of these teams, North Carolina, uh, Alabama, Baylor, Arizona, are these teams that I want to own stock in as teams that could win a championship or make it far in and win four straight games over two weeks? Absolutely not. These are extremely volatile teams. We've seen it repeatedly all season long. Like Arizona, if Caleb Love is cold, they could lose to anyone. Baylor, if Ray J. Dennis is throwing the ball into the seventh row, they can lose to anyone. Alabama, Shout out to Jim Root from Three Man Weave. Uh, they are going to lose to anyone, but they're not losing to Colgate. By well, so. a- a- Al- you're right. Maybe. <laughs> I still have my suspicions Colgate could take that game. Alabama uh, has the worst uh, momentum metric on Haslam metrics. Like they, they have the worst momentum of any team in the country, worse than teams like Rutgers and Michigan right now. And they're a four seed here. Uh, and then North Carolina, yes, they, they should if this goes chalk. They're the best team in the region, but they're – 
They should be a three seed. They're the ninth best team in the country. And I get that we're rewarding the ACC co-champions or the regular season champs. They don't even get a trophy for that. I don't know. I don't trust anyone here at all. That's the point. And I'm frustrated because even on the lower seed lines here, guys, there's a lot of teams that aren't Cinderella's in this region, I don't want to back Colgate. I don't want to buy stock, but like, God forbid, if James Madison was in this region or Moorhead, even you mentioned at the top, like uh, McNeese, if those teams were in this region, I think you could talk yourself very easily into an elite eight run or beyond. Instead, we're sitting here like, Hmm, can, can Charleston get hot and win three? I don't know. So uh, that leads me to my pick, which I'll save for the end. But I, uh, I have four different double digit seeds winning their first round game. In this region, you have Colgate beating Baylor. I have Colgate beating Baylor. Stuck. I oh do. I do. Uh, I listen. The athletic concerns are one hundred percent. I totally get it. With that said, Colgate has a really good three point percentage defense. They have the nineteenth best. That's, that's, that's not going to matter. Whether Baylor's dunking. We'll see about that. We'll see. Sometimes Baylor can't dunk. Sometimes they throw the ball out of bounds. I'm telling you, they're error prone. No matter who they play, it's not necessarily opponent dependent. Um. But we'll see. They're they're going to need an A performance to beat Baylor for sure. Colgate, what did Colgate? Colgate lost by twenty when they stepped up this year. Lost by twenty seven to Arizona, eighteen to Yale, and Il- Illinois was seventeen. That game 17 wasn't a, a, Illinois. Yeah, that game was kind of competitive. We'll see. It's more selling Baylor than it is buying Colgate, like I said. But I think there's key categories that Colgate's good at that reflect poorly on what Baylor wants to do. All right, fair enough. Uh by the way, I'll, I'll, Anthony, I'll throw it to you. You're minus 10,000, maybe for some Joe Girard slander and his <laughs> defense against these, the excuse guard against this New Mexico backcourt. I will say, look at Clemson. And by the way, I have a Clemson Final Four feature, which, and I, I BYU gets Duquesne as a six, and Clemson gets New Mexico as an 11. Give me a break. Best uh, 11 seed I ever. Will, the 11, yeah, they're minus two and a half. They're two and a half point favorites over the six seed. It's ridiculous. But I will say, I have not seen one person say Clemson's going to win that game. Um, well, it's so scary now because New Mexico is, just won yeah. the conference. Yeah, so that means Clemson's going to win. And by the way, just because don't just because of these results that happen doesn't justify the committee or you know even if the committee was right. These are random results, like. Just if Virginia could go to the Sweet 16, it's a crazy tournament. Um, and the team that always gets slandered the most generally makes a run. So it means like Virginia is going to go to the final four. It doesn't necessarily mean they deserve to get in. Uh, NC State won the ACC tournament, doesn't mean that they're the best team in the ACC. Um, but uh, I'll go to you. What, what are you seeing in the West? Yeah, there's two teams that I think are really interesting, and it kind of gets to the point about like the committee not making a ton of sense because, yes, the bracketologists who looked at wins and losses and net and resume and said, well, Michigan state, like their record's not very good. The committee seemed to benefit the fact that they have these really good underlyings like Ken Palm uh, because of the fact that they've lost so many close games. They've had incredible run bad shot quality, uh, you know, luck metrics, close game luck. All of it has gone against Michigan state this year, all season. And thus the committee said, Oh, we think you're better than your record. So we're going to give you a bump. But then they also said New Mexico, who played half the season without Jamal Mashburn, wasn't going to be in the tournament unless they won the Mountain West, even though the metrics had them close as a favorite against Boise and Colorado two days ago, teams who they had in the tournament. So uh, it is interesting that they pick and choose what they want to use and what they what they value. Us as betters, like we know, like New Mexico is a favorite over Clemson for a reason. Uh, I get kind of scared because it's like the Utah State Missouri vibes from last year when Utah State closed two, two and a half against Missouri and then couldn't make a three the whole game against Missouri and they lost. They got kind of out athleted at the rim. But yeah, Clemson's perimeter defense has real holes, not just Joe Girard, but generally speaking, uh, you can get at this Clemson team. And I think that when we've seen House, Mashburn, and Dent healthy, uh, they've combined that with improved rim defense this year consistently to uh to be a threat so i think new mexico you know you look at this draw you mentioned baylor that would just be like a, a guards just cooking and and i think new mexico's got the better defense so i think new mexico would have a very real chance there they're probably a short dog so there's like some 250 265 plus 265 to make a sweet 16 that's interesting to me 
The problem is I kind of want to go against Zona, but I don't really like Dayton. I'm not really a big believer in Nevada. Uh, I, questions about Nevada's offense being sustainable, and I have questions about Dayton's defense. And then if Zona gets slowed down, I think you can beat them. But New Mexico is not going to do that if they get them in the Sweet 16, nor is Baylor. So I think it's hard to out Zona Zona. So I might just have Zona in my Elite Eight anyway, even though I don't really love them uh, in this region. And then Michigan State for me is a team that everybody in the world is going to be so shocked if you're not like a, in the gambling community when they see the line for this game and it's UNC minus three, three and a half, four, four. Yeah. Four tops. <laughs> and they're going to be like, oh, well, you know, what's the Vegas knows you're going to hate a lot of that. And I don't know. I think like Michigan State Michigan has State some. Wins. Yeah. That's my thought. So I think UNC is the one seed that goes down the first weekend. I'm going to have Michigan State uh, in my Sweet 16. Yeah. Yeah. I will. Yeah. I will. Like New Mexico is an 11 and Utah State got an eight. And New Mexico just won their conference tournament and would be favored over Utah State. Uh, the Mountain West seating is just bizarre all around. All right, good stuff in the West. Let's wait. Can I get my pick real quick, Stuck? Let me give you my, yeah, my sure. final four pick from here. We well, we'll, do we final barely... four. We'll, we'll do okay. final four at the end. We'll do it okay. at the end. Your initial final fours. Okay. Uh, right. And it gives me time to do mine because I haven't done my initial one yet. Um okay. let's let's move on to the Midwest where Purdue is the overall number one seed. The only, the only thing I've filled out my brackets of ours, I have the winner of Montana State grambling, advancing past Purdue. I don't know what to do from there. Uh, Tennessee is the two seed in the Midwest. Creighton is the three. Kansas is the four. And I think that this, you know, this region overall was, you know, it looks to me, it's like a pretty fair, balanced region like i think that the east is a gauntlet the west is pretty easy like the east and west should be mixed like some of the lower seeds they should swap but i think the midwest is a pretty fair bracket uh with purdue is the one tennessee is the two you have the narrative game that'll kick the tournament off between virginia and colorado state to see who plays texas if virginia wins the mountain west sucks if virginia loses virginia sucks and i can tweet all night about it um so the narrative one half of the narrative police are going to be out in full force on twitter for that one got a pretty fun one between gonzaga and mcneese state as well in a 5 12 that should be a fascinating game and then kansas sanford is you know what's going to be looming all week with that game and you could see some interesting line movement is like when there's intel on kansas's injury situation it's been reported that they should have McCullough and Dickinson fully healthy, but you'll start to have practices and reports leak like how healthy are they. That game, for what it's worth, will be played in altitude in Salt Lake City along with Gonzaga and McNeese State. Anthony, as your our Midwest correspondent, I will throw it to you. What do you see here in the Midwest? I'm calling it the region of the chalk because I do like all three of the top seeds here to make the Sweet 16. Uh, and I think the most interesting thing for Purdue is that they are going to be the biggest Utah State fans you'll find in that first round matchup because uh, you know Utah State strength running their offense through the post through Osibor works for them in the Mountain West but they were not great in the non-con they didn't really play anybody in the non-con in that sense they they, they, they played well and that they won games but they didn't really beat anybody worthy uh, of really note uh, they had a whole roster turnover they get a TCU team who doesn't really shoot the ball well. Utah State likes to take away the three. They kind of cheat out on guards a little bit. And you saw even like Fresno and San Diego State using this to their advantage, cutting behind them, using the athleticism and getting easy looks at the rim over and over again. That's kind of what TCU can do. And I, I don't love the matchup for the Aggies uh, against the athleticism of TCU. I think that's a big problem for them. Uh, but the market, you know, is already you up think to TCU minus with three. TCU's guards could give Purdue issues? Is that what you're And that's the thing, Purdue? yes. Yeah. Right. We've seen that before. They could press them. They could run in transition. Um, but the problem is if Purdue gets their pace that they want, how is TCU scoring in the half court? Uh, I'm not sure they can. So that's that's the one issue for them. The the Gonzaga McNeese Kansas Samford quadrant is going to be the one that I stare at the most between now and Thursday. 
because I really think Gonzaga is a little overseeded and Kansas is just such a walking question mark with their injuries. It wouldn't shock me if they lost to Stanford. Sanford. It wouldn't shock me if the whole world picked Sanford and then they just get smoked because like you said, it's not necessarily a great matchup. Kansas's biggest weakness is that they don't have consistent three-point shooting to me. And I think that's why their ceiling is pretty low in this tournament in the sense that I don't really see them getting past uh, a game, but if maybe they'll get McNeese and then it's a different conversation. So that section's a little uncertain. I'm much more confident in Creighton and Tennessee. I think Creighton and Tennessee have pretty high floors that they're going to make the second weekend. And a lot of it is that, uh, you know, South Carolina is an overseeded six. Oregon is the classic darling that everybody's going to fall in love with. But if they get Kalkbrenner in the second, you know, second round, I think they're well equipped to deal with the pick and roll that Colorado seemed to not know how to guard uh, on Saturday. I think they would deal with that much better because Kalkbrenner's so uh, adept with the with the drop coverage. So I think Creighton's got a pretty high floor to get to the second weekend, setting up Creighton in Tennessee, uh, which I think is a true coin flip game. You know, when in doubt, I trust Connect to get a bucket over anybody else on Creighton. But, you know, the Jays have so much more versatility offensively in the half court. So I would lean toward Creighton. And I just really want Purdue to play Creighton because it would be the epic matchup of the most fouled team and player in the country against Creighton who never fouls. And I think the refs, the ref discourse has the potential to be off the charts for that game if it's in the Elite Eight. So I'm going to go with Purdue and Creighton as my Elite Eight here. Uh, one other note, you know, Colorado State, they get a, uh, an interesting matchup because, you know, we've seen Brian Dutcher for San Diego State have really effective physical defense to kind of take Colorado State out of their motions. And I trust Tony Bennett as a defensive game planner as much as anybody in the country. I, I'm not sure 118 and a half is high enough or is a low, uh, yeah, high enough for that matchup. Uh, I think it's going to be played in the, in the fifties. So you mean low enough? Do you think the total should be lower? Um, yes. Yeah. Low enough. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I will say Purdue, Kansas would be you know, Dickinson, uh, Dickinson, Edie rematches. Um, I, I like the, now the help for Kansas throws a wrench into that. But I do like Kansas against Sanford. I want to get some health reports first. But because if they're not fully healthy, they have depth issues and you're playing in altitude against Sanford. There's a million guys they play. But Sanford wants to play so fast. And as we're talking, this line's probably going to go all over the place. It was like eight and a half. It got down to six and a half. It just bounced up to seven. Um, as, you know, Sanford wants to play so fast. No one gives up more transition possessions in the country than Sanford. And they play zone, they extend their pressure. And Kansas press deep press offense hasn't been great this year. But you don't, I don't, you cannot, you should not ever zone Kansas. Kansas' zone offense is elite. And I, you don't want to let Kansas run. Like Kansas in transition, if they're healthy, that just spells disaster. So, like, that's what scares me about Sanford. It's like they're a team that wants to play super fast and let a more talented team just get buckets in transition. So a lot of it's going to depend on Kansas's health, though. Greg, let me throw it to you. What are you seeing in the Midwest? So I, I like that the Bundo talked about chalk is the word here, because to me, this is how much do you like your potential Cinderella in McNeese here? Um, now, Gonzaga is a good basketball team, but not particularly imposing. Like, I think a lot of people are going to pick McNeese to win that game. Then they're in a pod with the injuries we mentioned, McCullough and Dickinson. Okay. Then all of a sudden you're imagining a Sweet 16 matchup with Purdue where I would honestly argue, guys, Purdue might be hoping that it goes chalk and they avoid the demons of, hey, we got the St. Peter's break again. We have a 12 seed with the Elite Eight on the line and all of a sudden the nerves build and we've been here before. Uh, McNeese has the firepower to beat Purdue, in my opinion. With that said, I, I, I think matchup-wise, if it falls in Purdue's favor here, Utah State and TCU both uh, are are not great at protecting the rim. Like, they're 200 and 300s uh, at two-point percentage defense. Kansas, we have no idea how ready to play Dickinson will be. Uh, if you believe Bill Self for the Big 12 tournament, like McCuller would have played. Dickinson absolutely wouldn't have. That was the report. So that seems ominous to me. I know people thought that injury wasn't serious, but I don't know necessarily that we are – confident something has changed from last week to this week with Dickinson. So I, I do, I, I'm going to trust my gut that Purdue makes it out of that top region. The bottom, 
man, a, a lot of people are going to like Creighton. And stylistically, them in South Carolina would be fun. Uh, same as Texas and Tennessee. Like, that would be a really, really fun round of 32 matchup. I can't shake the feeling back to chalk here. We could get Zach Eady versus Dalton Connect with the whole uh, – there was supposed to be some Twitter drama, right, of National Player of the Year with Dalton Connect trying to chase down Zach Eady's heels all season long. Uh, I think of the four regions, to me, I am most confident that we would see the one and the two meet in the Elite Eight here. For that first time since 2019 but uh like you said stuck that doesn't always happen so we'll have to see yeah purdue and yeah. tennessee played I mean, that McNeese, crazy okay crazy game yeah. to 2019 yeah mcneese i don't it's like what, what is, what's their, their tallest guy is what six eight uh so that is a bit worrisome against uh ek and then how are they stopping Edie? like if mcneese gets there um like that's they don't have any size at the rim, and against Gonzaga, you could have Shahada Wells. By the way, playing Gonzaga again for the second straight tournament, the TCU transfer, uh, who's on the team. One of my most favorite gambling moments because I bet TCU and uh, they hit that three at the buzzer after it rolled up the court. Uh, but can Nebhard lock him down and then Ek just eat? Um, in that scares me a, a little bit but gonzaga mcnee i agree with you i think gonzaga is, is definitely overseeded and we know that for sure because they've moved up to the five because byu moved to the sick down to the sick because they can't play on sundays uh calabrese what are you seeing in the midwest yeah i'm basically on board with the the chalky assessment i have purdue over creighton in the elite eight the only thing i'll push back on i do i do get the rationale that it's not an ideal matchup for sanford but what has Kansas done on the road in three and a half months? What what are their best wins? At Oklahoma, at Oklahoma State, that's it. Losing to UCF, losing to West Virginia, losing to all the top teams, and that they are banged up. And it's a question of McCuller getting the green light, but with the bone bruise, like, does he have a limp off? Is he like, you know, not actually at hundred percent? He's just gutting it out. And the Dickinson news that that's enough for me to take a swing here. I just think this Kansas team. I talked about it on the live uh, bracket reveal show. It's just a different animal psychologically when you're always either winning the Big 12 or right in the thick of it till to the 11th hour. This was a weird year for them, and then they just roll into the Big 12 tournament and lay an egg. I understand that they didn't have you know a full deck by any stretch, but they basically just laid down for Cincinnati. So I have real motivation concerns for a team that, okay, if you get two wins, your reward is potentially getting fit, fed into the wood chipper by Purdue. Uh, I, I I don't see it. That That's just me on Kansas. Um, so I'm going to take my swing there. I'm probably going to take both those teams in the 12, 5, and 4, 13 matchups to have an upset and maybe push. By the way, if you're wondering what Kansas has done on the road lately, over the past month, Sanford is 0-2 on the road with losses to Mercer and Wofford. Okay. I mean, then, listen, I – well, Somehow Bill Self lost to Bucknell in 2005. Somehow these things happen. So I, I'm just going to say the Stanford team, which is in, an incredibly veteran team, they play fast and they have all the bodies to do it. They got 10 players who average over 12 minutes per game. They're playing at altitude, so that's, that is an advantage for them. They're going to take chances defensively. I agree that it's probably a mistake to get into a track meet with Kansas. But if they can force turnovers, they're the sixth best team in the country doing it. I like that. And seven of their top eight players are all juniors or seniors. So I think they have the makeup. They probably are going to need to make a whole bunch of threes, but I, I just see it happening. So I'm going to put my put my neck out there and say the Bulldogs got it done. Yeah. I mean, the only thing that scares me about Sanford, like they just don't profile as a good upset team, like the way that they play historically. Um, and I know it was early. They stepped up in class twice all year. They lost by 10 to VCU and they lost by 53. I bet them that Purdue. game. Sanford. Hey, plus a couple of runs and a half go their way. Night. You know, they, they could have been in it. They got, they were down, they were down 20. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, uh, I have like two quick, take, I, I have two quick tidbits before we move on here. Stock. Uh, one, one on Purdue. Wait, Sanford could get Sanford, Sanford, Purdue revenge game in Why the not? sweet 16. Why lost not? By 53, get their revenge, go to the elite eight. The, the it's, it's tough tip. to beat a team twice in one season. I, we all know. <laughs> the pregame tip heard around the world, boys. We had Graziani, right, against Edie to kick off college basketball season. We could see that in the NCAA tournament. You kidding me? Uh, I, I will say this on Purdue. As someone who watches a lot of Big Ten basketball, if you 
if you're looking to try and identify where you might pick off Purdue matchup wise, I actually think it is worth Grand. finding teams that will not try to defend him traditionally one on one in the post. And it, that's why, like, it, it, in a, uh, an imaginary Hunter Dickinson Purdue matchup to me, Edie torches him, especially if he's slightly banged up. Uh, it, if you find a team like McNeese, who, like you said, stuck, goes very small, would have to get creative. And has a bunch of guys who can shoot physical guards, Shahada Wells against Braden Smith, who's a little banged up based on what he did in the Big Ten tournament. That would be much more interesting to me than a team trying to like single cover Zach Eady for 40 minutes. The way to beat them is use a bunch of junk guys, foul the crap out of him, force Doubles, the officials traps. to make calls. Yeah, it's that's why they the lost. Northwestern and Nebraska do that. That's what Fairly they do. Dickinson did that. Yeah. In Ohio State, like Zed Key and uh, Akpara, two different bigs you can get 10 fouls out of. So I do think that would profile well for McNeese. And then uh, final thing, I just I, we have to mention, someone has to mention this. Despite the concerns with Kansas's injuries and despite the concerns about who Gonzaga is as a team, isn't there a world where Mark Few and Bill Self are looking around like they gave us Matt Painter and Rick Barnes and Rodney Terry? Like coaching does matter at this point in the season. And if Kansas is healthy, I'm not saying they are, but if they are, if they flip a switch, they still are one of the only teams in the country, maybe the only team in the country with three wins against Ken Palm top five opponents. So I, I just wouldn't forget the fact, like there's a lot of coaches who have underachieved in this tournament in this region, outside of the two teams we're saying we're skeptical of their rosters. Yeah. Calvary, any other thoughts on the Midwest? No, that basically wraps it up for me. Um, you have Sanford do, in the Final I, Four? I mean, Sanford, well, all the way to the national title, cutting down the nets. Um, I do like Colorado State to get past Virginia and then also get by Texas um, using the traditional play-in game as a springboard. Um, that UVA game is going to be a battle. So first, first team to 52, I think, wins it. Yeah, if anybody I, – I didn't bring my Colorado State shirt to New York because I didn't think we were going to need the, the play-in, so – I'm going to have to quickly get one for Tuesday night. Calabrese and I, if anybody knows of a Colorado State bar in New York City, uh, hit my line. South Carolina, Oregon, under, by the way. I like that. Um, all right, let's move on to the south, where Houston is the one seed. Marquette is the two. The three seed, Kentucky Wildcats, and four seed, Duke. Got a couple of the blue bloods there. Wisconsin is the five. Texas Tech is the six. Playing NC State is the 11. I'll, I'll lead this off here. Uh, I, you know, the first thing that jumped out to me was great path for Kentucky. Um, you have, you play Oakland in the first round. Now, granted, there could be some variance here. Oakland plays his own defense, plays as much zone as anyone in the country. I don't think you want to zone Kentucky in that offense, but. You know, there it, there will be shooting variants, right? They, Kentucky could just be chucking threes and missing them all. But it's not like, you know, Townsend's a good player for Oakland, but it's not like they're a rim attacking offense. They're jump shooters. And it's hard for me to see Kentucky getting upset this year. And then you get either NC State or Texas Tech. We'll see how healthy Warren Washington is. I tend to think Texas Tech could blow NC State out. Um, I'm going to go back and look. I'm going to do this for our podcast on Tuesday, I'm going to look at all the shocking past conference tournament winners and then see what they've done in their first game. Um, like NC State physically and mentally, emotionally has to be exhausted. Now, it will matter if Warren Washington plays because you need Warren Washington for DJ Burns. And DJ Burns can just eat up Tech if he has anything left in the tank, can eat up Texas Tech. Texas Tech just loses size drastically without warren washington but uh, nc state might be like a public darling after what they did and there might be some value fading in there but i'm gonna i'm gonna dig into that a little bit more but kentucky good path like nc state texas tech winner and then in the bottom half it's you have injury concerns florida lost hanglotton i mean he he matters a bit uh, in their post they do have good post depth and then you have marquette we don't know how healthy tyler kolick will be dealing with an oblique injury. So just a ton of injury uncertainty in Kentucky's bottom half of the South. Texas Tech with Warren Washington, one of the most important players. Um, you have Marquette, Tyler Kolick, their most important player. Florida just lost someone in the post. So like 
you know, not the worst draw in the world for Kentucky. We'll see if they can finally get to a second weekend, which seems to be a chore under Calipari. And in the top half, Houston, I think, should get through here. Like the teams who could threaten them, you know, I feel like they would just bully ever like a lot of these teams like Duke, for example. People might have Duke over Houston. I've I've said before all year, Duke's soft. Like that's what we've seen in the big especially against North Carolina. Like they're physically soft. And the one team that they you don't want to play if you're physically soft is Houston. I specifically called out this matchup before the bracket. I said, like, if Duke had to play at Houston, they would get bullied. Reminds me of, like, what Duke last – was that last year against Tennessee or a couple years ago? Was that last year? Last year. Last yeah. year, yeah. Same thing. Like, Duke – like, so I don't – I'm not even considering Duke. Like, the one scary team is A&M. Just, like, A&M won't, is physical, and they won't be afraid of Houston. And then you just have, like, the variants of Wade Taylor. Like, does Wade Taylor go for 50? or not and like houston was up to like 25 on them and AM came back and tied the game i think it was in houston or it was i think it, it was, was neutral was site in, in neutral site in houston yeah the toyota yeah. Center. um and they came back and tied the game with like a minute to go um but i'm probably gonna have houston going through to the final four here there are just too many question marks i don't trust duke against houston and then in the bottom half you know, Kentucky, I think, has a favorable path because of all the – like, I can't trust Marquette because of Colic. You know, Texas like, – all, all these other injuries. So, I think I'm going to have Houston coming through the Final Four. It would be a fascinating matchup if it was Houston versus Kentucky because I think at their peak – so, at their peak, Kentucky has the best offense when they're all making shots, like, talent-wise, and Houston has the best defense. Uh and I think Houston would end up prevailing in that matchup, but it would be like just from an X's and O's and contrasting styles would be fascinating. I think Houston would just gobble up offensive rebounds and, and get their stops. Uh, but I, I have Houston coming out of here. A lot of question marks in the South, a lot of uncertainty, Devundo. Uh The region of uncertainty is what I wrote down. Uh, so do you, do you have anything in the South or is too much uncertainty for you? I'm kind of interested in Colorado. I know they just got beat uh, in the I would conference. Like to hear more because I have a Colorado future. I think it's a it's a matchup. I think there's a few matchups here that that work out well for them. You know, they can I think have a ton of size advantages inside if they were to get Marquette. Uh, Florida has some major flaws defensively, especially at the rim now with the injury situation. Once he went out, Auburn got layup after layup after layup after layup today, uh, and I you know it's hard when you. It's your first game and they're going to get challenged right away. I think with Colorado in the, in the uh, potential seven, 10 game there. Calibre there's always about... one of these teams that's in a plan every year that seems to Sweet make 16. a run and yep. like gets to the sweet 16. Boise state uses their size that into their advantage in mountain West play. That won't be the case against Lampkin and De Silva, De Silva yeah. and the Colorado guards who are all long, right? So that's a pretty good matchup for Colorado. Yeah, I like it. And I think, uh, you know, if you're betting on talent, they've got two guys who are going in the top 20 of the draft. Colorado, Three guys, guys who will get drafted. Right. And that's a, that's a lot of talent. And, and they're a team that struggled early, but really put it together, right? They finally started winning away from Colorado down the stretch in, in Pac-12 play. And, and yeah, they got beat by Dante in the, in the final because they had some foul trouble and he was just on one you know, you tip your cap kind of game. Um, but I think Colorado is live to make a run here, mainly because I agree. I think that Kentucky is, you know, I kept trying to say like, you, know, you can make the same case for Kentucky because they have two top 10 picks, but the defense just never figures it out. Then they're, they're in the list of teams, like you mentioned earlier, stuck where if your defense is so bad, you're just going to lose because somebody's going to keep scoring on you. Uh, and then Colorado, the other Kentucky team, would be a shootout. Where like exactly. the last team with the ball wins, and that's like, what I have in my sweet sixteen. Questions. Colorado can make a run, and uh, some of the other teams that went on runs that immediately came to mind: Virginia Tech a couple years ago went four and four. They got beat pretty comfortably by Texas. Georgetown got smoked by Colorado in the first round, and then Oregon State, who somehow made the Elite Eight and almost made the Final Four. Um, so those are the three that I that I had. But uh, in terms of the top half, I agree. 
I don't see a ton of paths for Houston. Juwan Roberts, did he just pick up an injury that I missed? So that's a concern. Um, I think they just basically said, because he's been dealing with injuries, that they just didn't want to um, – he had like a hand injury, then his shin. Um, he's, he was healthy enough to play, but I think they were down, and then they just said, we're resting him for the second half. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's I a concern. Think, they need him. Okay, I mean, they've already taken a couple hits. Yeah, it's certainly worth watching. Do you see anyone in the top half that could take them out? No. Greg, let me throw it to you. What are you seeing in the south? Yeah, I I think you're hard pressed to find any alternative solution to Houston for all the reasons that you guys said. Just too many question marks. I uh I have this I don't know this this dwelling feeling I can't shake that like. I know I should pick Kentucky because the draw opened up on the bottom half and I like all, all the reasons are well documented that if Tyler Cole's banged up, Marquette's not who they should be. Texas Tech and NC State are both just kind of bleh. Florida now lost their center. Like it, it is wide open. They are begging Kentucky to make a run here. And I just have this shaking feeling we're going to end up with like Texas Tech in the Elite Eight because that's always what happens whenever there's a darling team we want to get there. Um, I actually, I, I on Green Dot Daily the other day, I uh, I gave out James Madison and Oakland as two teams I thought could pick somebody off, and um, I do like JMU over Wisconsin in round one. I just think um, it's a it's a bit of a sell high on Wisconsin given the shooting performance they just put on in the big 10 tournament stuck when you know my head to head battle with Greg guard this week. And uh, they were really impressive. That's not the team that they've been over the last 15 games. So I'll trust the 15 game sample size over the three game sample size in Minneapolis. Uh, JMU to me has been the best mid-major team in the country this season. I think that's going to be a popular public pick. A JMU Duke game in round two would be really fun. Uh, I don't think JMU is particularly physical, but they're certainly skilled and like you said, you, you have that S word, the four letter S word concerns with Duke on when are those going to show up? Um, but either way, the winner gets Houston. So I'm not even going to spend too much time debating it in my head. I will be very, very surprised if Houston does not emerge as the winner of this region. Yeah. Uh, Juwan Roberts on his bruised right shin, by the way, just sore, nothing too crazy. Uh, sat the second half to rest up for the NCAA tournament. So I would imagine he should be okay. Uh, and yeah, I don't think he'll have to work too hard against Longwood. Um, for what it's worth, Houston, historically, uh, in the first round, usually bludgeons teams. I usually bet them in the first round. Let me look at some of these past results. Um, and I hate laying these like enormous numbers. But um, let's see. I mean, Longwood is good on the defensive glass. Um, and they can offensive rebound. But, man, they're going to be out physical in this game. Uh, let's see. Houston in the first round of the last two years. Last year. They struggled. But they also had the injury yeah, they, last year. Yeah. Sasser. They struggled last year. They, they only beat Northern Kentucky. I think they were like 15-point favorites, maybe. Uh beat UAB by 14, but they were like a four. Maybe a four they were laying seed. eight that game because I had them. They were maybe a four Cleveland seed. And then State yeah. the year before that by 31. Um, What's the date? March 17th. This is like four years ago was the. Think about where you are four years ago. This is the date. This is. Was this the day before everything fell apart? I think it was March 18th. Um, I'll never forget. It was where I was for that. Um, and they beat Georgia State in 2019 by 30. Um, who was playing? It was Creighton. St. John's was St. involved. St. John's. Yeah. John's mascot was sitting all by himself up in like, you know, the 300 deck. And that was that was the beginning of the end. And I, who did I have a bet on in that game? Hold on, I got to find this game. They only played half, right? And then they called it off. Yeah. I was on a plane and I didn't buy the Wi-Fi. And I told the guy next to me, when we land, the, everything that I dream of in March is canceled. But like it's definitely happening. And when we did, it was it was devastating. Hold on, let me look this up, David, and then get one final thought to get out of here. Um 
I still have it on my DDR. I've kept it. This Creighton, it's just like, I don't want to delete it. I don't know why. Um, but I had a bet on that game that I hit in the first half. I had the first half, about the first half, and I, I was doom betting. I was like reading the news. I was like, they're going to cancel everything. So I was firing every bet possible, knowing that I'm not going to be able to bet the rest of the tournament. And I fired like, I don't know, like 15 bets in um, for the rest of the day that all got voided. Um, but I did hit the halftime bet in that St. John's game. They never finished the second half. So when you're going through a rough stretch this tournament or you lose a bet, you know, as we all inevitably will in horrifying fashion, just remember we have the tournament this year. Four years ago, we did not. Uh, Cal, any thoughts you want to add on the South region? Yeah, I a lot of what you guys have been saying, I've been agreeing with. I do think Kentucky is live here because of the draw. I am interested in fading Florida off of their run. I think their tank is empty a little bit. Hanglington, you know, going down, I think definitely hurts in terms of their best calling card, which is their offensive rebounding. So I would be more interested in Colorado if they were to win the play-in game than Boise. Um, JMU, also an upset that I had picked. The the one I'll push back to the, the group here, we're confident that Houston's just going to blow out Nebraska if they draw them. We, we've basically been talking about every other team except for Nebraska in the top half of this bracket. You know, before they match up against Illinois, who Houston is never going to be confused for Illinois offensively, they were all the way up to, what, two in Ken Palm defense or Bar Bartorovic defense since February 1st. They have the potential to get hot in Tamananga. Like, I, I don't know. I, I think... Can Tomonaga play in that game, though, is the question. Like, it, I don't know if he's physical enough. It might be a game yeah. where he gets benched for long stretches. Yeah, but I, I think to, to push back, too, does Houston go on a drought in the second half as they've been wont to do, particularly when they play better defensive teams? Um, so I, I I do like Houston to at least make it to the Elite Eight because I think the matchups are, are good. But in terms of circling a spot to take the points... I think the Cornhuskers could surprise, and I think they're the opposite of a public team. We've talked about this before. They they never make the second weekends. I think everybody views them kind of as like a lark just to make the tournament in the first place. But I guess a lot of teams, a lot of people just not watching Big Ten basketball this year. I think when they bring their A game, I think they can go 40 minutes with Houston. And then it's a question of, can anyone other than Shed make a shot down the stretch? I, I wouldn't put it on Cryer. Cryer has certainly shrunk in big moments, and he's really kind of underwhelmed me in the second half of this season. So, yeah, I think that's just a, a matchup to potentially care about if they're able to get past an A&M team that's 100% on three-point variance. When they shoot and make 10 threes, they're one of the top five best teams in the country. And when they don't, they look like they should be in the CBI. The interesting thing on A&M, with this matchup with Nebraska is it reminds me a lot of their first round matchup last year. They drew a big 10 team that shot a bunch of threes, Penn state Penn state ran them off the floor. The threes were falling. They made 59%. Now Jalen Pickett is a more physical player than anybody in Nebraska's backcourt. So the physicality concerns are real, but if the threes are falling, I do definitely see a world where Wade Taylor's aren't variants and it snowballs. All right. Good stuff. Let's get, before we get out of here, we'll do our preliminary final fours. Mine will almost certainly change. Um, I'll probably have like three of the same that I'll give out now, but I'm going to spend the next set 18 hours I have dedicated. I'm not sleeping tonight, going through every single one of these games. Um, so I inevitably will probably change one or two. I have to go through all matchups and future potential matchups, but I'll I'll say mine first. I'm going to go UConn, Baylor, Houston, and Tennessee. So I'm probably going to come out. Where I'll change is I'm probably going to have a crazier seed get there. But I don't know. I got to go through the matchups for that. Um for what it's worth, we've had a double-digit seed make the Sweet 16 in each of the past 15 tournaments. Um, so that create the you know that crazy finding that crazy team is is very difficult to do. Um, and I might end up having 
it come out of the West where I think the top seeds are vulnerable. Um, but like, you know, like a, who's, you know, like no one, no one in the world's going to have Clemson getting to the final four, but like if Clemson could beat New Mexico, which I'm not sure they can, they can beat Baylor. Um, you know, Arizona could be picked off by anyone. And then like, what, who's Clemson going to get in the elite eight? Like North Carolina, who they already beat Michigan state, St. Mary's. Like that elite eight opponent is not scary. So if Alabama, like, come on. So if you want to pick someone like a lower seed, I think that West, like it could be New Mexico. Uh, it's definitely not Colgate unless you're filling out Greg's bracket. Um, but if you want to get crazy, even Nevada, um, I think that's like a good place to target. Not only because I think Arizona is vulnerable, but because I think North Carolina might not make it there. But even if they do, whoever comes out of that top half, you're not really going to be scared of. Um, so that's my initial final four. Connecticut, Houston, Baylor, and Tennessee. Uh, Greg, you were itching to give out your final four of Colgate and whoever else. So who do you got? I was. I was more itching to unveil my Elite Eight matchup in the West. And maybe this is where you'll stumble to after your sleep insomnia tonight stuck. Uh, in that matchup, I have St. Mary's in New Mexico in my chaos wow. region. And uh, I have St. Mary's making the final four. And then I'm chalk everywhere else. Uh, UConn, Houston, Purdue, St. Mary's is my initial run at it. And on the one seeds, it never feels good. You think New Mexico beats Colgate? Uh, wow. <laughs> no, no comment. No comment. Uh, <laughs> it, on, the, on the one seeds, it never feels good. I never enjoy writing in three one seeds. But I do just want to throw this out there. Uh, I, I think the story of this season, even if we've talked around it a little bit in circles, is legitimately that there are three teams that are worthy of being like the number one overall seed in any given college basketball year. This isn't last year where there was no elite team and we're looking around at what's going on. There's three elite teams in college basketball to me. And uh, if for various reasons, there are good draws for each of them here. But if you go back through season by season and you look how many years have there been with teams that are plus 30 adjusted efficiency margin in Ken Palm? And yes, looking backwards, there's been boosted numbers by the runs that these teams made. But UConn and Houston, 32.21, 31.72 right now. Purdue's right below the 30 clip at 29.12. The only two years in the last nine that we've had teams above 30 multiple were uh, the Gonzaga Baylor clear year where we had two elite teams they met in the championship and then a couple years before that there were actually five teams uh and three of them that were above the 30 clip made the final four when you have teams this good don't look to get creative trust the teams that are this good i think it goes chalky in those three regions the bundo what do you got yeah i i i, I agree uh i think uconn is a class above everybody in their region, even though it is a tough region, like who would you confidently say will be at UConn or even like could go all the way. I think Auburn has the best chance, but I think Auburn might lose in the first round. So I'm going to go with UConn. Uh, I'm going to take Houston in the South. Uh, my surprise is that Colorado makes a run to the elite eight uh, because I, I, you know, and I can always change it if they lose to Boise before the before the brackets lock. Uh, but yeah, Colorado to the Elite Eight for me, beating Kentucky in the Sweet 16. Uh, Purdue, Creighton. I think that's Purdue would get Kalkbrenner in foul trouble just because Edie gets every call he wants. And I think that would be enough. that they, they would have, Creighton would have enough depth to take them down. So Purdue. And then I'm going to go Michigan State to the Final Four in a, in a surprise I'm going to lean into the Izzo narratives. I really think they upset UNC. And then, like you said, you know, we're not, I'm not too high on Mary's. I'm not too high on Bama. Uh, and then I have Arizona, New Mexico on the other side with Zona getting through uh, and Zona, Michigan State. My preliminary is Michigan State to the Final Four. On the Izzo train, but I am championing, championing Anthony's bracket because I have a Houston national title future and I have a Colorado Final Four future. So Colorado, Houston, the Elite Eight matchup has my full blessing. 
Uh, and I have a Kentucky future. Something in the South has to happen good for me because all of my futures are in there. If not, who who it'll be Duke. Duke comes out of the South, I'm gonna lose it. Um we'll absolutely lose it. Um all of the threes go in for Duke. Calabrese. Are we doing Elite Eight or Final Four here? I feel like everyone's stretching say. it. Yeah. Uh I'll start in the East. I got Yukon against Drake, and I got Yukon winning it, going to the final four. Out West, I'm going to get real gutsy and I'm going to go New Mexico to the final four. That's my chaos pick. Um, it's balanced out by the fact that in the Midwest, I have Purdue and Creighton with Purdue going to the final four and then Houston, Kentucky in the South. I just have this hunch that Houston's finally going to get bit in a big moment by not being able to score the basketball. So I'm going to go with a Kentucky team that I know exactly what their, their warts are, where their issues are. But when I look at this potential road, whether it's Colorado or Marquette in that sweet 16, I'm not scared there. And I think they just find a way to score enough to get by Houston. So going Yukon, Kentucky, Purdue, and New Mexico. A Mountain West team in the final four. What could go wrong? Yeah, yeah nothing. Absolutely nothing. Houston. They're going to play all the games at altitude somehow. They're going to put balloons on top of the arena and just get it up to 2,500 feet. All right. Uh, that'll do it for us. Appreciate Mike, Greg, and Anthony for joining me. Thanks to our producer in the back end. Most importantly, thanks to all of you for listening. It's time for us to go get to work. We can start breaking down these games even more. And we will have two episodes on Tuesday night. It'll be out overnight Tuesday. Go through every game of an episode for Thursday and an episode for Friday. We'll also have a tournament live show Wednesday afternoon. And then we will have live BBOC episodes, 10.30 a.m. Eastern on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So make sure you tune in for those tons of content coming your way. Good luck on all of your bets. By the way, Purdue, uh, NIT even, Wake Forest, App State. I don't think Wake Forest is really going to care here. App State revenge game. They lost at the buzzer at Wake last year. Um, I like App State. I haven't seen a line, though. Um, anyway, try to get some NIT talk in some of these episodes if there's anything I like. But make sure you subscribe, unsubscribe, subscribe, tell a friend, tell an enemy. Leave a review, a five-star review. I'll do some giveaways soon. It's the best time of the year. Xavier, Georgia, NIT first round. Get excited. Enjoy the madness. And we'll see you on Tuesday night. Cheers. 